operations in parallel for every possible fractal, yeah. cryptographic, what the fuck. And the sense is already and built so in. It, it, it is every time, time looking at all the implausible things. And so it's not going to take any more than the number of steps that it needs to get the definition anyway, just because it's looking at everything. Yeah, it computes everything. Mm. And it's actually, if you, if you are concerned about the compute time as being part of the definition of complexity, that actually kind of helps you in a way. Because it means that working out the complexity of something is now bounded in time. Because you're not interested in all the explanations that take forever to run. The bad news is, if you can try formalizing a definition of complexity, like Kolmogorov complexity, with time in there, it gets a bit difficult. You run out of problems. Eleven complexity is one, and we're going to run into that in a second. We're going to come up with that. Okay. So, yeah, catch, not computable. And this is why we're ignoring compute, compute time, but we have this optimal predictor. Okay. Okay. So... Some people say, well, Solomon conduction has nothing to do with reality. It's all, you know, infinite computation, da 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 da. Well, if you, the, the approach we're taking here is that you define something in theory and then you look at how you can approximate it, right? So we've got a concrete target, how do we approximate it? And it turns out with Solomon conduction that it's this ultimate prediction scheme, and if you break it in certain ways to make it a bit more tractable, you actually get a whole lot of standard statistical things coming out. So we get um, map estimators, MML estimation, minimum description length, maximum entropy. Um, so one view of Solomonoff induction is that it's sort of a model of ideal inductive inference when you're ignoring computational cost. And then in practice, what we have to do is we have to try to approximate it. Um, and really the only point I want to make here is that even though we're ignoring computational cost, it's not completely disconnected from the world of statistics. It's, it's actually, you know, if you, you, you can do equations, make some simplifications, and get a whole lot of normal statistical stuff that is computable out of it. Right? Okay, and if you want to know more about that, that's the reference there. And common graph complexity in general, that's a pretty good, it's one of the standard references. Okay, so, what we've done so far is we've come up with this perfect predictor, okay? Perfect theoretical predictor. But we, we want more than that. Our definition of intelligence required an agent which interacted with an environment, right? So the agent can't just sit there and observe the world and internally figure out what's going on and predict what's going on. It has to actually make actions in order to achieve some sort of goal or something. And so we, well, we, we need more than just prediction. We need, a, we need to have this active agent. And so a standard way of doing this sort of thing in, um, in, the, in the area is called reinforcement learning. So basically, we have our agent, we have our environment, the agent can perform actions that affect the environment, and then there's rewards come back from the environment, or you know, more realistically, the, the agent has some, some part, sub part of it which it can't modify, which decides whether what, what is a reward or not. But theoretically, this is a more useful, it's easier, nice setup to work with. And then we have these other things which are just observations. So that's just observations of what's going on that has no particular reward meaning. And this is standard setup called reinforcement learning. Okay, and so the agent's goal essentially, its, it's internal goal, is to maximize the amount of reward it gets. Okay? Um, now this produces um, some interaction history over time. The agent performs an action, the environment returns an observation of reward, the cycle continues. And so I formalize this as follows. So the A's are the actions, O's are the observations, R are the rewards goes along over time, up to say time t, and then because I'm going to have to deal with some complicated uh, combinations of sequences and so on, I need a little bit of notation here. So what I do is I stick, stick these three symbols together and then index them one to t. So this whole sequence here is AOR, all of them up one, one to t, okay? So that's going to help shrink down some of our equations. Okay, so we take an agent to be a probability measure over actions conditional on the history. So basically, the agent has everything that's observed so far, all the, all the actions it's taken, all the observations, all the rewards, and then there's some probability distribution over what its action is going to be. Okay? So this is a very general agent. If it's deterministic, only one of these things will have a probability of one, everything else will be zero. Um, and this is a more compact notation here, it's just the same thing. So this is a very general agent. We're not assuming it's computable. It could be working by magic. 
So long as it defines a distribution. It can be stochastic because it's a distribution. So it's a very, very general class. And it's conditioned on the entire history. So we're not making any Markov assumptions or anything here. This is very, very general. And we want to keep it that way. Um, the environment, we just essentially do the same thing, but it's the other side of the interaction. So we have a distribution over what the next observation will water are, given the entire history so far. Okay? And the agent's goal is to maximize total expected reward. And so this is the V function here. So this is the interaction between our agent pi, the environment mu, and the expected amount of reward it gets is the expectation. Okay. So, <clears throat> this is a very, very general framework. And I want to emphasize that. You can put just about anything you can think of in here. You can have playing chess. You could, um, you, you're one player, you've got another player, the other player is the environment, um, your actions are moving your different pieces, um, the, you observe the moves of the, of the um, other player, and maybe you get a reward for winning the game, otherwise you don't get anything. Another possibility is you might get rewards as you take pieces. If you take the opponent's queen, you get a positive reward. If you lose your queen, you get a negative reward. If you, if you're, if, if you lose the whole game, you get a big negative reward. Okay? Um, going through a maze, answering questions on IQ test, you have to answer the questions, you observe the, observe the test, um, you get rewards for doing well. Um, passing a Turing test, you get a reward if you pass, you have to interact with um, you know, somebody on the other end, you try to figure out whether you're a machine or a human. Writing an award winning book, you, anything you think of you can put into this kind of framework. So it's very, very general. And so we have to think about what is our opponent likely to do? We have to consider the space of all the different things the opponent might do and predict what it's likely to do or not do. And so if, if I was playing chess against Gary Kasparov, Gary Kasparov would probably make moves that were not optimal if he was playing a grandmaster. Because he knows that I'm a terrible chess player. He can make a move and assume that if that's a slightly risky move for him, I will miss some subtle reply to it, and then he can crush me, right? But he wouldn't do that move with a grandmaster because he knows the grandmaster will see what's coming up. And so, how you play the game depends on who you're playing against. If you really want to play optimally, right? If he cares about beating you quickly. Yeah, if he wants to, if he wants to destroy me quickly. If he wants to be really sure to destroy me, then he may act differently, right? Okay. But you can see that what's going on here is that you have to consider all your moves. Then, assuming that any of those moves are taken, you then consider what are the likely things your opponent is going to do. And then, for each of those possibilities, you have to then say, well, now it's my turn, what am I going to do? And you look at the best move. And then you consider, well, what is your opponent going to do? And you have this big tree of possibilities. And you sort of mentally go through this in your head when you play chess. So we have maybe something like this. <clears throat> this is our present situation. We can take the pawn, with the queen and get checked, we're going to lose our queen. So this, this step here is what we do. This next step, and th this next level, is what our opponent does. And then the next step is what we do. And it iterates all the way through, okay? And so we can assume, we're, we're free to choose our own moves. So we can assume when we're choosing our own moves, we'll choose the best move, as far as we can tell. So for, for this step, and for this step, there are our turns, we can, we can choose our own moves. So this, we, we'd have the maximum, we take the best. When we're looking at these other steps here, we have to consider how likely it is that our opponent is going to do different things in response. Okay? And so we have to, we have to know the probability of the agent doing, our environment doing different things. And we have to consider the consequences of them. And as we go through this tree, there's certain maybe rewards as we go through. So, um, Say going down here, lose a queen, well that's pretty bad. We take a knight, maybe, in return. So that sort of partly compensates. But it's still pretty bad. We get down to a checkmate here, and that's, that's really, that's the ultimate reward. <coughs> and so we have to optimize over this whole space of possibilities. So, how do we do that? We have this big nasty equation. And this big nasty equation is really the... This is, we're only one step away from the AIC agent now. So bear with me, we're getting there. This big nasty equation just says what I just said up here, that in symbols. So we have, as I said, we have our own actions. These are the A's here. And we maximize over these because we can choose our own actions. So we make the